Thank you very much, Jonathan, and, and good afternoon, and thank everyone for joining us. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge our friends and partners experiencing flooding in Houston, Texas. Uh, yesterday, uh, Representative McEachin and I were scheduled to virtually visit environmental justice communities in Texas. Community members were going to share with us the immense uh, damage that fossil fuel corporations are causing uh, to black and brown families in the Gulf region. Uh, they're always in our thoughts and uh, we shall visit soon. Uh, and that is the second time we've had to cancel uh, uh, this uh, virtual uh, meeting with uh, those communities and uh, we're going to make that up as soon as possible. Uh, for the last eight weeks, uh, uh, Representative McEachin and I visited some of the most polluted regions in the country, communities in Michigan, New Mexico, Louisiana, Los Angeles, and all shared with us the real human health cost of our extractive economy. Today, we will be speaking with a different frontline community, historically black colleges and universities that have been at the forefront of the civil rights movement uh, for generations. HBCU students launched the sit-ins at lunch counters. HBCU students, such as our dear friend, John Lewis, were original freedom writers. And now HBC you students are leading in the charge to fight environmental racism across our country. Uh, movement to our movement to guarantee the right to clean water, pure air, and ample recreation space sprung from H HBCU campuses, and now they are proactively training the next generation of environmental scientists and environmental justice advocates. Without their help, Representative McEachin, Senator Harris, and, and myself, the Environmental Justice uh, for All Act would not be possible. This bill essentially creates a new environmental justice grants under EPA, strengthens, importantly, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, allowing residents to seek justice through Title XI uh, of, of the Rights Act, strengthens the Environmental uh, Policy Act, NEPA, by extending public comment uh, periods and uh, and prior information to communities, creates an, an assistance fund for fair and just transition. And more, most importantly, it requires a consideration of cumulative impacts in permitting decisions under the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. Our success to this point would not be possible without the, the efforts of our H, HBCU community. In order to build momentum going into this next Congress, my committee will be holding a a full committee legislative hearing on October 1st. Uh, we are asking all environmental justice communities across this country to submit letters for the record before October. Uh, we must show now that now is the time to pass comprehensive environmental legislation. Um, my colleague and partner through this endeavor, uh, that's been almost two years now, uh, the difference in, in the development of this particular piece of legislation and others that we, we see in Congress is that we built ours uh, from the ground up. Uh, we, we felt that in order to, uh, to have legitimacy and relevance uh, to environmental justice communities and, uh, and communities of color across this country, uh, that their involvement at the, at, the, at the initiation of developing legislation was essential. So uh, we held a summit, 400 people came to DC from EJ communities across this country. Uh, we uh, had an interactive process uh, where commentary and suggestions were on a, a constant through the development of the bill. We set out the draft legislation. We had responses, which created some very positive changes in the legislation. And at the end of the day, uh, we filed the legislation. Uh, we feel that uh, it's a unique piece of legislation. It is, uh, it is inclusive. And it deals directly with uh, beginning to to, uh, to deal with this uh, disparity that has existed in our country for far too long. Uh, the panelists today, a distinguished group of uh, individuals that we are uh, proud and in one instance to welcome back, Dr. Wright, uh, and others to uh, to welcome them to the discussion and and looking forward to 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 their. Uh, to their comments as panelists. Let, let me begin by, first of all, introducing uh, Dr. Robert Ballard. 
Uh, he's often described as the father of, the envir of environmental justice. He is the former dean of the Barbara Jordan McLean School of Public Affairs at Texas Southern University from 2011 to 2016. Professor Bullard uh, currently is a distinguished professor of urban planning and environmental policy. Prior to, prior to coming to TSU, he was a founding director of the Environmental Justice Resource Center at Atlanta, at Atlanta University. Without uh, any, uh, any further uh, ado, let me now turn the, the time over to uh, Dr. Ballard, sir. Time is yours. One moment, uh, Chairman, as we unmute Dr. Bullard. One second. Thank you. Oh, well, good morning. Can you hear me now? Good morning, yes, Dr. Sure thank you very much for being with us. Um, yes, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I want to thank you for this opportunity that allows representatives and leaders from HBCUs to speak on Environmental Justice for All Act, a bill that embraces the core principle that all people in all communities have a right to clean air, clean water, and a safe and nourishing environment. Uh, it has been our belief all along that federal policies can and should uh, seek to achieve environmental and climate justice, economic justice, and health equity for all without regard to race, color, or national origin. Your zip code should not uh, be the best predictor of your health and well-being. And as HBCUs uh, and their graduates have a proud history and have played a major role in educating and training scientists, they also have played a major role in producing knowledge and research when it comes to environmental disparities, uh, in addition to developing the foundation for and the underpinnings of the environmental justice movement and, and gathering the kinds of, of facts and data to show the disparate impact and risk and threats borne by low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, we need stronger environmental protection, not weaker, watered-down regulations. This Environmental Justice for All Act does that. The current administration has dismantled and rolled back more than uh, 100 rules and, and, and laws designed to protect workers, consumers, and the environment. Uh, these changes and rollbacks have hit Black and other people of color and poor people hardest since America is segregated and so is pollution. Polluting industries such as toxic waste facilities, high risk chemical plants, oil refineries, cold fired power plants, and highways and freeways have turned many uh, black and brown communities into environmental sacrifice zones. If we look at across the country, 79% of African Americans are more likely than whites to live where industrial pollution poses the greatest health dangers. And it's not just a poverty thing. Black households who have incomes of 50 to $60,000 live in neighborhoods that are more polluted than whites who make $10,000. A 2018 EPA study found that in 46 states, people of color live with more air pollution than whites. And African-Americans are exposed to uh, 1.4 times more fine particulate matter than whites. And, and recently, uh, a Harvard study found that air pollution is linked to higher COVID-19 deaths. Persons living in areas with higher uh, pollution are 15 times more likely to die from uh, COVID-19 than someone in regions with one unit less of fine PM10, PM2.5, I'm sorry. There are negative consequences for environmental racism. And if we look, look at racial redlining that may have occurred 100 years ago in the 20s and 30s, is showing up in terms of urban heat islands. We are pleased to see the Environmental, um, uh, Justice, Enver Environmental uh, Justice Act for All, including provisions, as uh, uh, the chairman said, in terms of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that needs to be dis uh, strengthened because of the bad uh, US Supreme Court decision uh, that was made in 2001, Alexander v. Sandoval. Uh, our communities are not just under one kind of environmental threat, 
you have cumulative threats. And so to have a cumulative impact assessment as part of this uh, 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 bill makes a whole lot of sense. The executive order 12898 that was signed by President Clinton in uh, 1994 needs to be codified and strengthened. When we talk about NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, that's been a backbone for a lot of the environmental justice um, uh, uh, struggles in terms of making sure that the impacts are assessed and that we look at what's going on before these projects can go forward. Environmental justice is about health. And when we talk about chemical safety, all of, many of our communities are surrounded by a lot of these chemical plants. I live in Houston, it's a major problem. So when we talk about this whole question of grants and research and resources, that will be distributed in a way that can allow our communities and our universities to have these community university partnerships. And, and finally, I think it's important that we talk about the provisions of workers and a just transition as we move to a green, uh, uh, clean uh, energy future, that it is inclusive and that we do not leave any communities behind in this transition. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Doctor. It's very much appreciated. Uh, let me now introduce uh, um, a friend to this effort, um, Dr. Beverly Wright. Uh, is an environmental justice scholar and advocate, author, civic leader, and professor of sociology. She's the founder and executive director of the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice. The center addresses environmental and health inequities along the Louisiana Mississippi River Chemical Corridor and the Gulf Coast region. With that, uh, Dr. Wright, let me, uh, let me turn the, uh, the time over to you. Thank you, Congressman, and uh, good morning. Um, I, I am really um, excited uh, that you decided to include uh, HBCUs as a part of this discussion. Um, and I always tell people that I, my, I owe my advanced degrees to an HBCU. Um, I went to a, a relatively small college in Northern Louisiana, which was like a foreign country for those of us who grew up in New Orleans. And um, at that school, that school is known for football. But I tell people that we can walk and chew gum at the same time at Grambling State University so we've also produced doctors and lawyers and accountants and PhDs such as myself uh, in sociology. Um, I think that this, um, this act, Environmental Justice for All, um, is an act that is extremely important. And especially when we look at the location of HBCUs and the people that HBCUs generally serve. Most of our universities are dead in the ghetto. Many of them surrounded uh, by polluting facilities. Um, Southern University in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which at one time was the largest HBCU is completely surrounded by pollution. And everyone who attended that school at different points have in fact, uh, have in fact been exposed. But I think that uh, the most Im important reason that HBCUs um, become uh, really um, necessary as we push forward in our fight for environmental justice for all is that on HBCU campuses, uh, students are exposed to many people who look like them and to other students who come from impacted communities. And on that campus, I can tell you that one of the things that you learn is that to be here, you are blessed. It's an opportunity that most of us don't get. And they also instill in you the notion of giving back. Now, I can't tell you any lecture that I ever went to where the professors told me, Beverly, you're really lucky to be here. And when you leave here, you should give back to your own community. I can't tell you any lecture where that happened, but I can tell you that those kinds of feelings were imbued 
uh, within all of us. And somewhere throughout the curriculum, you got it, even though no one, no one ever said it. Um, the, and that takes me to where I am. I am Dr. Beverly Wright working in the area of environmental justice because of, of an HBCU. The, my first experience in teaching was really at predominantly white schools, the University of New Orleans and then Wake Forest University. But I always had an, an ache to go back to HBCUs and work with communities. Um, that actually happened because of my uh, relationship with Dr. Robert Bullard, who just, by the way, gave you all of the facts. I need not review those again. But by working with him um, and, and putting in place what we've now developed into a whole theoretical concept called community other people call it community-based participatory research, but we were doing it long before that, that happened. But working um, with Dr. Bullard um, and actually beginning to collect data um, that basically showed what our eyes could see. And that was the enormous discriminatory practices in citing and um, regulations not being followed, putting African-Americans in the, in the Mississippi River chemical corridor at risk. That, that led to um, our, in my involvement, along with many others in the environmental justice movement. But what that also did was gave me just a drive to make certain that students at HBCUs understood what environmental justice was and then use their expertise, whatever they've learned to give back to communities in um, trying to eradicate environmental justice. And out of that for Dr. Bullard and myself came the development of the HBCU, HBCU Climate Change Consortium, which at this point is made up of 32 universities across the uh, Gulf South and even all the way up to um, Philadelphia. That consortium has really enabled us to almost do rapid response in communities that are impacted. But more than that, it led to the development of the HBCU Climate Change Consortium where we actually bring young people all together to hear from the, 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 the most important and most learned scientists on climate change and to present their own research. But most of all, we entice them to join this movement in that way, growing the ranks of young people who will come behind us to continue this work. Uh, Congressman, I wanna thank you so much for putting this act forward as Bob has laid out perfectly all of the, um, all of the advantages that lie ahead for us if in fact we are able to move this forward. But I also again wanna thank you for recognizing HBCUs. And I guess our promise to you is that we will continue to work hard to make certain that there are young people at our universities who value the life of black and brown people, really the lives of all people, and they will use their talents to move us forward. Thank you. Thank you. And I and and, and uh, uh, um, Mr. McEachin and I both understood that uh, HBCUs and the consortium of 32 university colleges. Uh, was an essential bedrock in, in how the legislation moves forward when we do pass it and is signed into law. Uh, I, I think in, in communities, the need for, in the, in the communities that we all uh, come from and, 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 and represent in one way or another, uh, the need for academic uh, and uh, research expertise uh, it, it's going to be vital. Uh, you know, your your sometimes uh, uh, EJ communities are put up against a slew of scientists that happen to be working with this chemical company mm -hmm. or with this oil company, and and to be able to counterbalance that with uh, real information from intellectual and academic centers like H HBCU universities and colleges is going to be a formidable tool uh, for this legislation. We see that, and 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 see that, that on the horizon is something essential 
to how this, this law is implemented and how it's uh, interpreted. Let me now uh, ask Dr. Nataki Osborne Jelks, Assistant Professor in Environmental and Health Sciences at Spelman College in Atlanta to join us for this talk. She's also the manager of the Community and Leadership Development Programs uh, for the National Wild Wildlife Federation and chair of the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, an organization committed to ensuring environmental justice in Southwest and Northwest Atlanta's African-American neighborhoods. An environmental engineer by training, uh, Dr. Jelks is, is a committed to being a social change engineer as well. Uh, doctor, time is yours. Thank you so much, Congressman, for this opportunity to say just a few words. And I'll, I'll just add to what Dr. Bullard and Dr. Wright uh, began to lay out. Uh, one, in terms of uh, my appreciation for your work, your pioneering work on the Environmental Justice for All Act, um, but also in terms of your um, foresight and willingness to um, spotlight and highlight the work that is happening at HBCUs um, with respect to the fight for environmental justice. Um, as Dr. Bullard and Dr. Wright have already sort of laid out, um, I also want to um, just share a little bit uh, about how HBCUs are innovators uh, and incubators, if you will, of social justice innovation. Um, we have community engaged scholars who teach our students. Um, we offer a pedagogy of transformation. Um, we use the expertise that faculty bring, but also the creativity, um, the interest and the ingenuity of students um, to work in partnership with frontline communities. Um, and in this work, we're able to center those community voices and those community concerns um, and really teach through our curriculum, teach our students um, to use the skills um, and the education that they are, are gaining um, to help us to address um, these challenging problems in our society. We're elevating the consciousness of these students. Um, and when they leave our doors, they're not just wanting to be top-notch scientists or scholars or, or corporate leaders, but they are working um, to push the envelope um, to fight against things like voter suppression, um, to start the dust of changes to rise in our communities with respect to environmental injustice um, and the uh, widespread uh, inequities that we see in our communities. And I speak today not only from what I see and from what I am engaged in um, as a faculty member at Spelman College, but also because this is my story. Um, I went to Spelman College and I came to Spelman College uh, after living in several different places, but one of those places was Baton Rouge, Louisiana uh, in the Cancer Alley Corridor. Uh, Dr. Wright already talked about the fact that, um, you know, students and those who lived around uh, the Southern University campus um, were exposed to the many facilities. And so, and that's a part of my story as well. My parents, uh, who are also both H HBCU graduates, taught at Southern University. Uh, we lived um, close to the campus and less than a mile away from where we lived um, were pol polluting facilities. And so I began, um, by the time I got to Spelman, to really connect the dots um, between the, um, the dirty air, um, the bad tasting um, and foul smelling water that, um, that we had uh, in our community. And I connected that um, to quite honestly, my, my mother's diagnosis with, with breast cancer. And it's not that we can say, you know, beyond a shadow of any doubt that um, what we may have been exposed to is the reason for her diagnosis, but really just the fact that that possibility existed gave me the impetus to want to get involved. And so as I was coming um, to understand all of these issues and challenges and coming to understand that this community that I lived in was actually called Cancer Alley, um, I was able to follow up that new interest and a passion for working with communities um, by the education um, that I that I received at my HBCU. Spelman College is a part of the Atlanta University Center Consortium, um, which is now composed of Spelman College, Morehouse College, Clark Atlanta University, um, and the Morehouse School of Medicine. And if you're a student in any of those institutions, you're able to cross register. Um, and what really made the difference is that I cross registered and I took a class at Clark Atlanta University with none other than Dr. Robert Bullard, uh, who was running the Environmental Justice Resource Center at that time, uh, who was uh, um, a faculty member in 
in the Department of uh, Sociology at Clark Atlanta University, and I took a class on environment and society, which broke down, um, you know, kind of in our colloquial terms, uh, what environmental justice is, what environmental racism is, um, and why communities of color were fighting against these injustices that they were um, experiencing. And so that experience, you know, paired with, um, you know, just the, the impact that Spelman tries to have on its neighboring community through that impact, um, I was, uh, I began to volunteer with organizations like the Southern Organizing Committee for Economic and Social Justice. And so I immediately found ways to pair what I was learning in the classroom to things that I could do uh, in, in, the in the community surrounding uh, Spelman College. Um, and so I'll just kind of fast forward and say from those experiences, um, I got a chance to work in places like EPA that at that time had strong partnerships with HBCUs and offered undergraduate research fellowships. And then I began to work with community members around me and we founded an organization um, that works to promote and advance environmental justice on the west side of Atlanta where we have some of, uh, some of the most uh, environmentally impacted communities uh, and some of the poorest communities. So I'll end um, with, with those points, um, but again, I just want to really lift up um, the role that HBCUs are playing alongside communities in the fight for environmental justice. Um, we have been there, we will continue to be there. It's a part of our mission to be aligned with these communities uh, that are in so much need and are challenged by so many different um, inequities in our society. Thank you so much again for this opportunity to uh, share. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Uh, our next panelist is Ms. Joy Simon, uh, graduate Dillard University and also a uh, master's degree from Texas Southern University. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, well, at Dillard, she studied and conducted research in marine biology at, a, at the Marine Biology Laboratory in, in Africa and in, in Jamaica. She presented her research at conferences like Emergent Research Nationals and the Ecological Society of America. Uh, Joy holds a master's degree in urban planning and environmental policy from Texas Southern University. And while at TCU, she completed a thesis entitled, Developing a Dis Disaster Preparedness Toolkit to Effectively Train Community, a community in Gizmar, Louisiana, in the case of a natural uh, and anthrop anthropogenic uh, disaster, uh, uh, prophetic, to say the least, in, in, in that last thesis. So uh, with that, let me uh, ask you for your comments and turn, turn the time over to you, uh, Joy. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak with you this morning, Chairman. As a panelist, I was asked to share my story with you all for the next five minutes in support of the Environmental Justice for All Act. To make it simple, I'm a former shy girl from the Deep South with big dreams and a big heart who aspires every day to make a difference. I was born in Houston, Texas, where one of the world's largest industrial ports is located, polluting the water, soil, and air daily. Shortly after I was born, my family and I moved to Geismar, Louisiana, a small African-American community along the Mississippi River, whose descendants were that of former slaves and plantation owners. Growing up, my sister and I were regularly exposed to carcinogens through constant chemical leaks and explosions. We developed a wide range of decreased respiratory functions in addition, we watched as many of our family members fell ill to cancer, even our maternal grandmother, a survivor, and grandfather who is no longer with us. As a little girl, my sister and I would play outside until the plant sirens would go off, indicating there was a spill. We would watch for hours as fires roared from the stacks of these massive facilities. On the way to our aunt's house, we would pass a large white mountain and make up stories of how we would climb to the top and conquer the South. But little did we know that the flame we watched burned every day was a flare as chemicals were burned off and their byproducts were released into the air. Little did we know that the White Mountain was just a pile of chemical waste. And little did we know that the sirens and smells that were released every week were cancer causing agents that contributed to the death of our loved ones. Though at the time, neither of us knew the dangers of the place we lived and played. I knew something was not right and I wanted to save my family and their legacy. As I began to do my own middle school version of research, I soon found out the place I love so dearly was called Cancer Alley, infiltrated with hundreds of plants on the grounds of former plantations that slowly ate away at the health of those who lived there. Taking the lives of many residents, 
like my family, that have roots that stretch back over 100 years. So I decided that I wanted to be a change agent. I decided to seek a higher education at the prestigious Dillard University and HBCU. While at this HBCU, I was transformed from that shy girl into the bold young woman you hear today. That HBCU gave me the wings I needed to fly and knowledge I needed to advocate for my community. At Dillard, I connected with people like Dr. Wright and others who taught me that environmental justice is not a choice, but a right for all. After graduating, she sent me back to the very place I was born so I could learn more about my rights. She sent me to Dr. Bullard and his team at Texas Southern University, another prestigious HBCU. They further groomed and prepared me to become a bold advocate for my community and other communities like mine. He sent me to places I had only dreamed of and exposed me to concepts and people I never knew existed. His entire team told me I was no longer allowed to be shy, but I had to walk with my head high, open my mouth, and be all who I was designed to be. I cherish my experience that I had at both HBCUs serving under Dr. Wright and Dr. Bullard. Today, I'm a doctoral candidate at Texas A&M University, learning even more about environmental advocacy and disaster research as I study how organizations within multi-hazard community of colors prepare, respond, and recover from disasters in order to develop methods to increase their capacity. I work with the Hazard Reduction and Recovery Center at A&M, all while helping my family run a small nonprofit and virtual tutoring company in the same community I grew up in. You see, everything that I went through, all the places I've lived, and all the people that I met prepared me for the positions I hold today. Everything came full circle. You see, the common theme in my story is full circle moments. Now, let me point something out to you right now. Right here, right now, we are all in a full circle moment. Chairman, you and your team have an opportunity to embrace this full circle moment as you push this bill through while the rest of us have the opportunity to vote in the upcoming election. We can make a difference for thousands of communities like mine that, give up, that get up every day and have to smell death. Many like myself who can barely take a breath in because their lungs are weak from breathing in toxins every day for years. We can make a difference for the women who are at risk of infertility, children who have to drink poison every day, and the countless families that have to watch as their loved ones shrivel up and take their last breath. Today, we are in a full circle moment. So let's all do our part to advocate for the passing of such a monumental bill so we can all experience fresh air, clean water, and long, healthy life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me let me just begin with some the discussion, and I, and I believe that Dr. Wright asked to leave early for another commitment, and I was remiss in not indicating that uh, my partner in, in this effort, uh, uh, Mr. McKeachin, is uh, uh, um, occupied with the issues that are going on on the floor and, and, and in Congress as we speak, and. Uh, uh, his absence is sorely missed, but his uh, presence has been consistent throughout this. And uh, uh, his uh, his point about insisting that uh, that we involve uh, you in this discussion uh, was was something that I thought was not only necessary, but uh, but I think, like I said earlier, builds uh, is going to be critical in the implementation of the law. Dr. Ballard, let me. Let, let, Two issues that we get pushed back on on the legislation. Uh, the normal one, you're going too far. Let's incrementally do this. Let's make sure that the working group uh, uh, regarding the executive order is functional and then we go from there. Uh, and uh, number one. Uh, uh, and number two is that uh, the, the economic consequences of of overprotection uh, for impacted communities. Uh, and then the, I think the, the third thing is just the political reality uh, that we're dealing with, uh, as you indicated, with an administration that has rolled back a hundred, uh, trying to dismantle the, one of the key weapons for EJ communities, which is NEPA. And uh, in the process, EPA, uh, uh, in, instead of enforcing and strengthening regulations is, uh, is in the process of, uh, uh, weakening and if not eliminated them entirely uh, in terms of emissions and 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 and, uh, and the accountability to polluters. I say that because what is said over and over again in the pushback is that it's about jobs. You're you're moving too quickly. 
And then the third thing is that uh, this has nothing to do with racism and it has nothing to do with discrimination. Those are just consequences of people having to, uh, choosing to live where they live. Uh, you've heard them all before, so have I, uh, but th this is the pushback. That in addition to, in addition to the formidable resources that come to bear from the industry, from the petrochemical industry and from the fossil fuel industry in terms of uh, who they support financially as candidates for Congress and for the presidency and who they don't. And I, I uh, those are going to be our obstacles. Those are going to be the pushback. Uh, uh, if you could, or any, any of the panelists can chime in on this, but let me begin with Dr. Ballard. Your reaction to that pushback, which you're, which you know about because you've heard it before, but I think it's important to to discuss it and and uh, why uh, why we need to why we need to press forward on this, Dr. Bell. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, all the points that you made have been points made for the last four decades that uh, most of us that have been doing uh, environmental justice work and anti-racism work. Uh, first of all. The executive order 12898 that was signed uh, by President Clinton in 1994 uh, is an executive order. It is not codified. It's based on two uh, very important pieces of legislation. The 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, Title VI talks to the issue of uh, non-discrimination in the allocation of uh, federal funds, and the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, a 1969 uh, law that was passed uh, um, under, uh, NEPA came under uh, Republican, you know, Richard Nixon. So when we talk about uh, whether or not this is uh, uh, somehow um, an issue that uh, can be politicized, breathing is not political. It's not something that we side, decide next Tuesday we're not going to breathe. So, so if we, so we need, because those two pieces of legislation have been uh, torn asunder and have been attacked, so the current executive order uh, uh, even though it had uh, some impact, has, has been weakened. So to strengthen that executive order and, and, and uh, codify the whole notion that, that, um, that there is no relationship between environmental protection and pollution being uh, disproportionately distributed uh, to where people of color are. Th there's a whole body of research and knowledge that have dispelled those, um, those notions. And so we look at the science, we look at the facts, we look at the data, and the data will show and point to that it's not just uh, uh, poverty, it's not just people choosing to be next door to pollution and breathing uh, poison. Uh, if we look at the whole notion of, of, uh, of cost benefits analysis and, and you cost out using cost benefit analysis that is tinged with racial bias will give the cost of a life of a person of color at a low ball value. And so the companies can say, well, uh, it's cheaper to keep polluting and keep doing business as, us as usual because uh, it pays uh, to have weak regulations. If we talk about this whole question of, of the extent to which uh, urgency of now to get these uh, regulations and laws rolled back because uh, we are seeing uh, the urgency of this pandemic is making the health disparities uh, and the gap, the health gap wider. And it's accelerating what we already had before this COVID. And so no, communities cannot wait. Uh, the urgency of now is is upon us. And I think the idea of the connection between environmental racism and voter suppression and disenfranchisement, all these things are connected and we have the data, the science and the information to show that, that intersectionality. And to talk about these cumulative impacts of all of these kinds of decisions that are made at the federal level and how they trickle down to the local level to create and, and maintain these environmental disparities, these health disparities, and these tremendous um, 
uh, illnesses and diseases that, that are descended upon communities that don't even have health insurance and the attacks on the Affordable Care Act and access to health care. These things are all connected and we need to pin them together in a, in a comprehensive uh, effort to, to, to move this uh, total agenda of eradicating uh, these uh, disparities and these inequities when we can do that. And I think the time for doing that is right now. Thank you very much. Anyone else, please? Would like to comment on that? I think Dr. Bullard uh, covered it well, but the only thing that I'll add is that um, it's so important that provisions with respect to cumulative risk and impacts um, are, are elevated. It's so important that, you know, things like NEPA are not stripped um, of, you know, uh, of the ability to look at those impacts as well. Um, the reality is that in our communities, we are exposed to multiple pollution sources at a time. So to take things and to look at them in a vacuum or in isolation um, does not um, begin to really um, to yield um, what we need to look at in terms of how the, the accumulation of these um, different pollution sources uh, impact communities and, and the role that they play in influencing our health. Um, so that cannot be, you know, rolled back. Um, we have to focus on cumulative risk and, and impacts. I wanted to, this is Dr. Wright, um, and I do have to get off in just a few minutes, but I just wanted to say that, um, and Bob presented it, that every one of these arguments have been, you know, dispelled through research. But I think the story that Joy told this morning certainly speaks to this notion of people moving to where these chemical plants were. These communities have been here in the South since the end of slavery. These companies moved into these areas and that has been shown scientifically. But not only that, discriminatory practices allowed them to move forward buying out white people and leaving us to linger you know, a language in these, in, in the middle of all of this poison um, that's, that's still killing us today. That's one thing. The other thing is to talk about us moving too fast. You know, when you look at the amount of years we've been dealing with this, and I've been in it 30 years myself. So, you know, what is fast? How do you describe fast, moving too fast? Yeah. And the other part that they always tend to win on is money. But we have seen with this administration that money is printed and used in as many dollars and as many ways as the people in power want it to be used. That, that all of the tax breaks that have been given to rich people versus and trying to cut food stamps for poor people tell me that the money issue is just not real. It is one that is made up. But lastly, I would say this. I believe that the thing that most um, um, congressmen or politicians are missing is that anything that they do to clean up these environments that helps the quality of life for poor people helps them even more because pollution does not remain in Cancer Alley. The waters in Louisiana are not the only waters that are poisoned. All of these things flow and climate change is impacting all of us and all of these things are tied together. So to the extent that they help us, they help all of us, they help the earth, they help people around the world, not even just you know, in, uh, in our state or in the United States of America. And I believe that is the, connecting the dots, which is a term that Bob likes to use, connecting the dots in such a way that they see in the end they benefit then there's not enough money. There's no amount of money that they would not expect, not spend to make certain that their families and their children were safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Chairman, I'll just follow up with what Dr. Wright. Thank you. For my community, we've lived there for generations. My family has been there since before slavery. So they were slaves on the very grounds that they lived in. So once the plantations um, and civil rights and all that you know, occurred, um, they the industries came in and they purchased the land for cheap and they built around um, the slave 
uh, borders and the people that live there. And so now it's so many people say, well, why do you live there? Get in, get out. Um, you can move away. Well, then if you don't pay me to move away, if I have a house that's been in my name for my great grandmother, my great great grandmother, and it's a legacy that I live in for free. Um, now you want me just to pick up and move somewhere that doesn't have a chemical plant and the house might cost me $300,000 to live in, but I can barely afford to pay my electric bill. So take so stating a case in that manner is just invalid because that's unfeasible for so many people that live directly across the street from a chemical plant and then the reality is they were there first so you can say that you're coming in and you're trying to um move us out but we were here first so how do you have the right to come in and pollute our water our land and our air excellent that's a great point i in discussions with indigenous communities uh, on the subject of environmental justice uh one can point to the Navajo people that uh, that have suffered uh, both both land, water, and human uh, contamination and uh, and suffering uh, from uranium mining and the waste generated from that. It's still ongoing. There's been a cleanup that has been going on for 30 years in one particular mine, and you know the 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 Navajo Nation has been there since time immemorial, and Suddenly, they are. They have had these decisions made about uh, uh, their community, independent of theirs, without any consultation, without any uh, discussion, and uh, here they are, 45, 50 years later, uh, still having to deal with the uh, the health impacts and the uh, the water and the contamination both on their land and water. Uh, I. At what point in history does one uh, acknowledge the fact that they were there, like I said, a millennium before anybody else showed up? But anyway, thank you. That was a good point. I um, one of the other one of the other thing we did a we did a hearing the other day on uh, on diversity in uh, in uh, interior, uh, and that included EPA uh, and and all the various agencies because. Uh, uh, Interior continues to be one of the lowest uh, in terms of their integrated impact in terms of having uh, uh, women and, and 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 people of color uh, within the within the ranks of, of, of the staffing there from science down to uh, or to park rangers to uh, uh, people that are responsible for the interpretation of the American history uh, to visitors etc. And, and uh, one of the issues, and I want to ask that because I think that uh, as we go forward, I talked about implementation, is also the reforming the agencies themselves in terms of their uh, their reflecting uh, the communities that that uh, that are America, uh, and in in that sense, uh, reinforcing what we're doing with the Environmental Justice for All Act. Uh, how how do you uh, uh, God willing and the creek don't rise, uh, that's one of, going to be one of the things that I want to really want to concentrate on is, is the diversity of, of our agencies that are under the jurisdiction of the Natural Resources Committee, which is essentially forest and uh, interior and to some extent EPA. Uh, so if, if, if any of you could, could comment on that, because, uh, you know, the, the, the colleges that you represent have, have provided to this country a wealth of talent educated talent time and time again. And, and it's how, how you recruit and retain people, I think is part of the issue as well. Uh, and so I, I, I wanted to, uh, I, it reminded me because somebody said that, I think you, somebody said I, I got to work on a fellowship, uh, I think it was, uh, with, through EPA, one, uh, one of you said that. And I, uh, how do we go forward? Because I think there's two things we have to do. We have to move this agenda forward and then for the implementation, we have to repair the damage that this administration's done to these agencies, and how it's been, how they've been corrupted, uh, and uh, and part of that to me is uh, how do we diversify the people that work in those agencies? So I just open it up as a as a question or for your comments. Not even a question, just your comments. So that that's a great question. Um, 
I, I mentioned uh, earlier having an undergraduate research fellowship with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, um, which had, you know, a program in which they work with HBCU. So I had a campus mentor, research mentor on campus. I worked in his laboratory. And then during the summers, I interned uh, at EPA. Um, and I mentioned that I got some very valuable experiences. I got a chance to work in the Superfund Hazardous Waste Division. I later worked in the drinking water section at EPA Region 4, which is based in Atlanta. Um, and that was also something that uh, was very instrumental in helping to determine uh, my career trajectory. So making those types of investments uh, in programs uh, where, you know, faculty members can work with those agencies, but also having investments made in those students um, is really important. That fellowship came with um, tuition support as well. Um, so it wasn't just the research experience um, and the uh, internship experience during the summer, but, you know, EPA for, I think, two or three years um, paid my tuition. Um, and so those are the types of investments that um, I think are necessary um, to get our HBCU students um, to make them aware um, of these agencies, the role that they play uh, in protecting our environment. And they can also understand what the career opportunities are with those agencies as well. Also, I think it's important that we understand uh, uh, diversity and changing demographics of our country and the workforce. You know, I'm a baby boomer, and right now, uh, millennials and younger outnumber, uh, they make up the majority. And there's going to be lots of uh, retiring and the need for replacement of, 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 of uh, different kinds of jobs in STEMs or other areas. And so we need to make sure that we are preparing uh, young people uh, to fill those positions and to fill that leadership. And in many cases, uh, given the income disparities that exist in our society, most of our African-American students and students of color will need some type of um, scholarship or some type of assistance or some type of, uh, of uh, support to, to get them uh, into those uh, positions in terms of entry level, uh, undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate. And so I think having those opportunities, just like uh, Nataki said, will, will provide um, a good trajectory to expand uh, and diversify the workforce. And so that we don't have shortages and that we don't have to import people from abroad, uh, that we have people who are trained and we have populations that are underrepresented, severely under underrepresented in those areas that your committee has uh, as a priority over. And I think the as we talk talk about those internships and those those uh, assistantships and those mentoring programs, uh, they have a proven track record of of turning out excellence and giving our young people uh, a head um, a head start. You have that internship. You have that that experience. Uh, it gives you a leg up when you are going for the real job. And so it's very important that funds are put in place to uh, to support those kinds of initiatives um, that that we know are needed. And 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 we have the facts. We have the data. We have the science. And what we need now is the will and the commitment to do what's necessary. Thank you. The thing about it is that we only know what we know, right? And so, so many people um, that's my age, we don't know don't have the exposure um, needed to obtain an internship or you know have access to those places and so I think what's really pivotal for organizations and agencies is to create create internships create scholarship programs um, and then go into high schools go into HBCUs and develop partnerships and consortiums um, that really heavily recruits minorities and exposes them um, and teaches them that they can have access to places other than just working at the chemical plant that's killing them them, right. Um, and so trying to go beyond that. And so, I mean, I've had opportunities, thanks to Dr. Bullard and Dr. Wright, to go to Paris and um, work at NRDC and so many other places. But if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have had access. So there's definitely a need to develop those partnerships um, and especially paid internships and scholarships because they can't afford to go and do those things. There has been other 
other good pieces of legislation uh, having to do with codifying research. Uh, uh, all, all, all are part of a, of a bigger picture of environmental justice uh, legislation uh, that other members have, have put in in the past and some recently. Uh, and, and, the, and they're all good pieces of legislation. They amplify what we're talking about here today. Uh, and I, I, I mentioned that because I, I also think that, uh, you know, the, the pandemic opened up this portal uh, that met, a lot of us already knew existed, but it pointed out the disparities in this country around healthcare. Uh, and, 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 and we saw it in the infection and mortality rate uh, among frontline communities across this country. Uh, I, I, uh, I think that, that uh, and we were done, we, we filed our bill before the pandemic became the pandemic. But we really feel that, that if we're going to deal with issues of systemic racism, neglect and discrimination, then there has to be a systemic response. You can't just paper things over and then hope that uh, with time that that somehow will take care of itself. It won't. And, and I think the point that Dr. Ballard said about codifying it into law, giving uh, communities uh, the tools to defend themselves and, and giving, uh, uh, providing the resources and the funding to be able to de develop leadership and also give capacity to the community uh, through, uh, through expertise and, and experts to assist them to be able to, uh, to counter issues like a uh, uh, cumulative effect, uh, issues like disparate uh, treatment and, uh, and violations of, uh, of regulations, et cetera. I, I, I grew up in, a, in, in Barrios in, in the neighborhood here where I grew up and I still live. And uh, in the eighties, uh, we were confronted with the, with the uh, contaminated aquifer, the aquifer that everybody in that neighborhood, predominantly uh, Latino and African-American working class, uh, poor. And, uh, and I remember the first reaction from agencies at that time were from EPA regional, uh, from our own county health department was that all these were consequences, the high rate of lupus, particularly women were particularly affected, uterine cancer, miscarriages, uh, and lost pregnancies, uh, the list goes on and on, that they were all because uh, of our lifestyle, because of our diet, uh, and that uh, there was no correlation. And I think Dr. Ballard already said that that correlation has been established time and time and time again. Uh, but unfortunately, in the in the debate ahead, we will have to repeat what that correlation is again and again. And I uh, I just want to give you an opportunity to maybe uh, and we fought that. We ended up having to win in court because we couldn't convince the agencies of the necessity. It became a super fun site and still in the process of keep cleaning that aquifer 34 years later. Uh, and the health consequences and the uh, property value consequences, economic, uh, continue. But I was going to uh, just try to end by asking you uh, your recommendations for us that are promoting this bill. There has been good support. Part of what we're saying has been embedded in the presidential candidates uh, uh, platform around environmental justice. Uh, the, uh, the select committee uh, in the House of Representatives that's dealing with climate change uh, made it uh, climate justice and, and and embedded this whole bill as, as a recommendation to, to Congress that it needs to be enacted. The Energy uh, Committee embedded our bill, the provisions of our bill into their, into their legislation. So there, there, there seems to be some momentum, but I, I still think that this will be something we'll confront with a new Congress. Uh, and, and as such, um, you know, uh, your recommendations to myself, Mr. McEachin and the allies that we have, some. Um, almost 80 members that have, are, are co-sponsors, uh, original co-sponsors of the legislation in Congress uh, going forward. And, 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 and this is uh, sincerely, uh, as we go forward, uh, 
how we message. And, uh, you know, we, we want to, we have spent most of our, our, our quality time with, with people such as yourself, impacted communities, because I think their voice can be very, very powerful in, in, in moving this agenda as they've been very powerful in getting us to this point. I recall when the uh, Green New Deal manuscript first came out, had nothing to do with frontline communities or the question of justice in the issue. And uh, some of us raised it and then it got incorporated into part of that as well. So uh, we wanna make sure that what we're talking about is not an afterthought when we talk about climate change, when we talk about the agencies and when we talk about this particular bill uh, uh, being enacted and signed into law. So any recommendations I think would, would honestly be well received. Well, I'll uh, open it up to you. Yes, I, I just like to, you know, first of all, commend the process that you uh, and uh, Congressman McEachin used, a bottom-up process, a process of building uh, on the, the foundation and the knowledge of real communities and then gathering the kinds of, of, uh, of uh, input from around the country, from different uh, voices and, and frontline communities. And, and building off of that with facts and with the science, with, with things that you can go in and show and understanding that, that uh, no matter how much uh, data and how many facts you have, facts alone has never been enough to, uh, to get justice in this country. Because if that were the case, uh, we, it would not have taken 50 yep. years to get notices on cigarettes that can't that uh, that nicotine causes cancer, um, lung cancer. So so stay the course, stay strong, keep reaching out, and and I think you'll keep getting more and more support uh, for for this uh, for this bill, and that others who see the 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 elements of this bill they see uh, the importance of incorporating uh, the elements in in the EJ for All Act into those other fields, like you said, the, the energy, the, the, uh, the climate, et cetera. That to me gives even uh, more strength uh, to the fact that you, you're on the right track. Thank you. I would just add that this bill um, is really helps the conversation around making sure that people are mobilized, um, that they're going to the polls. Um, this is one of the things that is at stake uh, in terms of you know, the ultimate passage of this bill, but everything that it represents. And so there are grassroots community-based organizations, um, you know, uh, community um, engaged nonprofits um, and EJ groups who are really um, promoting um, the fact that we've got to, you know, be there, you know, at the polls as one way to support the passage of this bill. So, um, as Dr. Bullard said, you know, keep keep pressing. Um, it, you know, it it it's it's a it's a challenge, it's a struggle, but um, I, mean, I think the grassroots are there um, to be of support. Yeah, I, 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 I you made that point a couple of times, and I, uh, you know, you got to try to dance this don't get too uh, partisan kind of a discussion, but uh, nevertheless, uh, 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 four more years of, of, of what we've seen and the trend that would escalate uh, would be devastating to, to EJ communities. It would be devastating to the environment in general in this country. But as we know where the, the disparate impact happens, it's gonna be in our communities. And I, uh, we, that's, that is a drum that we beat over and over again because uh, the more people that vote and particularly for frontline communities, the better opportunity we're gonna have to uh, uh, stop the aberration before it gets worse. But uh, thank you for those comments. I appreciate it. If there's anyone else? I would just follow up and say, um, just like Dr. Bullard said, um, going from a bottom up way of going and getting people's opinions and voices and advocating for them is the best way to just find out what's going on in their community, right? Because if you go and you decide what's best for me, it may not be what's actually best for me or the thing that I need and want. 
And so um, I think one of the best ways is just to continue developing those partnerships and just seeking to really um, go to community members and ask their opinions. But I don't really have anything else other than just going and get people's voices that are living there and young people. You know, the, one of the ideas that we got back because of that process was, was is, is central to what the bill looks like. And those were from communities that said, all is fine and good. The language is good. It is a, it's a, a, an attempt to make the response to environmental justice issues comprehensive, but uh, we need tools. Uh, we need enforcement tools and they're part of, of, of the legislation, but we also need to be able to uh, empower communities through, through a grants program that gives them the capacity uh, to uh, be empowered, create their own strategies, educate themselves, and then also to be able to draw upon the expertise that we choose as communities to help us in, in, in those strategies and those responses. Uh, that change, that's where we put in the grant program and the affiliations that we look forward to if everything goes well uh, with uh, uh, the consortium that you represent in the future, because I think that is uh, what communities ask for, and uh, they were absolutely right. And that was not part of the original bill, but it is now. I think that's one of my favorite parts of the bill is because you um, do capacity building or you're encouraging capacity building. And one of the things I did for my master's was develop a training course to, to, to train people who live in those communities. So seeing more tools like that is absolutely correct. And I would personally love to see like more grants and that we can use at our nonprofit to really just train our communities and say, this is what you need to be successful. Go out and do it. Well, I want to thank all of you, uh, doctors and uh, Joy. Thank you very much. I'm so you'll be a doctor soon, Joy. There's no question about it. Uh, and Dr. Ballard, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to uh, have you with us and, and, and the rest of you. And, and please, uh, if you can comment, uh, direct those comments to our committee. We'll be holding the hearing on October 1st, uh, just to keep this issue stirring and to make sure that it's part of the uh, discussion as we, as we head into November 3rd. Thank you so much and have a good one. Stay safe and much appreciation on my part and from my, uh, my partner, uh, Mr. McEachin as well. Thank you.